wanted to use really sure. one Those who argue that it's a woman's right to make that choice point out that it's the woman who must carry the pregnancy. It's her alone who will face the risks of childbirth. And too often, it is her alone who will have to provide for and raise the child. But there's another view to be considered too. But there is undeniably another person involved in this as well, an unborn child. This is not a statement of faith. It is a matter of medical science. And a human being has certain inalienable rights, primarily the right to live. And that's why this issue so deeply divides not just our politics, but also our families and our people. In weighing these two options, I know where I stand. An unborn child should be welcomed in life and protected in law. And it seems to me a decent, humane society will find tangible steps to help women with unwanted pregnancies, even as that society defends an unborn child's right to live. I imagine we will continue to debate these issues, and I suspect that we will continue to be divided by them for years to come. But I know that we are all impacted by the growing erosion of our faith in the American dream. For over two centuries now, ours has been a nation of optimists, an optimism driven by plenty of secure middle-income jobs, an expanding middle class, intact two-parent homes and strong churches and communities. But now a majority of Americans worry that our nation is headed in the wrong direction. Truth be told, we appear to be a people increasingly pessimistic about the future. This confidence, this crisis of confidence is, is driven not simply by a great recession, but by rapid changes in our society, our demographics, and our economy. Marriage and two-parent families are on the decline. One in three children in America are growing up apart from their father. The fastest growing household types are people living alone and two or more adult generations living together. We're getting older as a people, with 10,000 Americans turning 65 years old each day. As a point of example, just 75 years ago, there were 42 working age Americans for every retiree. Today, there are only three workers for every retiree. In less than 20 years, there'll be two workers for every retiree. And globalization and technology have fundamentally transformed our economy. We face more competition than ever from, than ever from other nations. Automation and outsourcing have taken away millions of stable jobs, and our economy is not producing enough new ones to replace them. And while almost all the good-paying jobs of today require higher education, it has become costlier and harder to access that higher education. Now, America has faced rapid changes before, but we've never faced so many all at once. This perfect storm of simultaneous societal, demographic, and economic change, it's left us pessimistic, insecure, uncertain, and increasingly divided against each other. It's an insecurity that can't be measured simply by the unemployment rate or by the performance of the stock market or the Dow Jones. It has to be measured by our people's confidence in the idea that gave birth to our country, that everyone deserves the chance to go as far as their dreams, their work, and their talent will take them. It's an idea, by the way, that's grounded not in a political concept. It's grounded in a spiritual one, that every single person is born with certain inalienable rights that come from God. The words one nation under God are not symbolic. They describe the purpose our founders saw for America. Virtually every other nation that was ever created was created to provide a homeland for people of a certain faith or ethnicity or language. But America was founded as a place where people could have the liberty to enjoy fully the rights given to them by God. This idea that all people have certain rights given to them by their creator, this idea has shaped our identity as a nation and as a people. It is the reason that ours is the single most generous and caring nation on the planet. 
when the freedoms of others have been under assault, it is America that has sent its sons and daughters to fight and die on foreign battlefields. When AIDS and HIV were sweeping through Africa, it was America that stepped in to provide life-saving medicines. When a typhoon hit the Philippines or an earthquake hit Haiti, it was our Navy that was first on the scene and our charities that continue to help those in need. It is a legacy that is simply unrivaled by any other great power in all of human history. But the belief that our rights come from God is also the reason why equality of opportunity so deeply defines us here at home. Because we don't just believe that it is right for everyone to get a fair chance to get ahead. We believe it's everyone's God-given right. So America is indeed an exceptional nation. But we would be foolish to believe that all we have we owe solely to ourselves. For we are also a blessed people. Blessed by a vast and fertile land protected by two vast oceans on either side. Blessed with natural resources and natural beauty. Blessed with an innovative and creative people. A collection of go-getters who came here from all over the world and placed a man on the moon and the World Wide Web at your fingertips. Through our compassion and through our commitment to equality of opportunity, America has been a light to the world. We have honored the blessings bestowed on us by God by adhering to the ancient admonition that for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And God has continued to bless us in return. Now, we are called, as each generation before us was, to further this task. Our current president has chosen to divide our people for the purpose of political gain. It truly is sometimes hard to believe that the state senator from Illinois, who gave a stirring call to unity at the Democratic Convention in 2004, is the same person who today, who today never passes up an opportunity to pit us against each other. But at our core, that is not who we are as a people. We are diverse, we are opinionated, and our freedoms allow us to openly and heatedly debate our differences in ways that other nations discourage or even prohibit. But we are united by a common value. For while our nation may be divided on the best way to achieve equality of opportunity, we all believe in the goal of equality of opportunity. And so it troubles us. It troubles us that now equal opportunity eludes too many of our people. And what we need not now are not leaders that will exploit this anxiety. We need leaders who will explain to us why this is happening. Because too many of our people do not have enough education, and therefore they can't find jobs. Because so many are being raised in broken homes. And because too many face the challenges of providing for their children as single parents all by themselves. We also need leaders that provide us with answers that will address these problems by fixing our education system and improving our economy, by highlighting the importance of marriage and two-parent homes, and by helping children raised in broken families and parents struggling with the burden of single parenting. No plan to restore the American dream is complete without addressing these things. We will never improve our people's economic well-being without also improving their moral and social well-being. The challenge for those of us in politics is that while our role is important, we alone can't do this. There is no magic five-point plan for restoring marriage. There's no innovative program that will instill the value of education and hard work. There's no law we can pass to make men better fathers and husbands.